Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who all, all things so wondrously reigneth. Shelters thee under His wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how all your longings have been granted in what he ordained? Hallelujah! 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 Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he be friend. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that have life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for a we adore. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Good morning. Let's come on in and take our seats. We'll prepare to get started here. Try to move towards the center if you can, just to utilize every seat that we have in here. All right, well, our call to worship comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. The, call, the purpose of this call is to prepare ourselves to worship Worship our great, merciful God. So please, please hear the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you with great gratitude. We are grateful for your mercy. Because without it, we would still be under wrath, waiting to be judged, waiting to be condemned. But, but you caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now we have hope, and that hope is secure and reserved. It cannot be stolen, lost, or defiled. It is secure and reserved for us in heaven, for all of us who believe, who believe in what Christ has accomplished. 
Please help those who haven't trusted in Christ. Help them see their need for salvation and turn from their sin and repentance and turn towards Christ in faith. Please help them not put it off until tomorrow. That is just further evidence of their deception. Please help them and regenerate them, Holy Spirit. And for us who do believe, Lord, help us be merciful as you are merciful. Help us forgive as we have been forgiven. May we do this out of love for you and others. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and lift our voices to praise the God who is our only hope. Go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly homes. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Is on his throne. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, His grace will lead us safely home. Though He dwells beyond the stars, His redeemed are on His heart, yes, even now. He intercedes, Jesus cares for all our needs. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, the King of love is on His throne. Hallelujah, hallelujah, His grace will lead us safely home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, the King of love is on His throne. Hallelujah, hallelujah, His grace will lead us safely home. Amen. Good singing. Please be seated. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 7 for our scripture reading this morning. We're reading through the book of John together on Sunday mornings. Last week we ended with Jesus going up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. He went secretly uh, at first, but now we're, this morning we see that he begins to teach openly in the temple. And the crowd is going to be amazed at his teaching, especially as he claims that his teaching is directly from the Father. One note in verse 21, he's going to refer to it, I did one deed. He's referring to a previous deed that he did. He's going to be, he's referring back to uh, his healing of a crippled man on the Sabbath back in chapter 5. So keep that in mind as we read. Follow along as I read verses 14 through 24. But, it, but when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but is his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel. For this reason Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ whom you sent to do your will and to teach your word. And we thank you for the profound nature of who Christ is and all that he accomplished Lord, our minds, our finite minds cannot grasp the full scope and magnitude of it all. And so we thank you for your word, which brings clarity and which brings hope. We confess that like the Jews, we are likewise guilty of, of judging according to external appearances. We do not always reach conclusions according to what is true and right. So we ask that you would transform our hearts and minds and help us to view the world as you see it. Help us to see it according to how you have taught. Help us to see, Lord, according to the light of your holy word and grant us humility so that we may humbly walk in your ways and not the ways of the world. And Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful news that we've heard from Romans 3 in recent weeks, the glorious news of justification through faith alone in Christ alone. We pray that you will continue to give Paul wisdom and clarity as he, as he continues to unfold your word for us. Help us to hear and listen with humble hearts and to reflect deeply on the profound riches of the grace that you have shown us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning as we continue to sing, we boast only in Jesus Christ. We glory in him. 
He alone is our portion and everything to us. Let's stand together. I will glory in my Redeemer whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My holy Savior before the holy judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness, the Lamb who is my righteousness. I will glory in my Redeemer, my life he bought, my love he owns. I have no longings for another. I'm satisfied in him alone. I will glory in my Redeemer, his faithfulness, my standing place. No foes are mighty and rush upon me. My feet are firm held by His grace. My feet are firm held by His grace. I will glory in my Redeemer who carries me on eagle's wings. He crowns my life with loving kindness. His triumph song I'll ever sing. I will glory in my Redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold. And when He calls me, it will be paradise. His face forever to behold. His face forever to behold. I will glory in my Redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold. And when He calls me, it will be paradise. His face forever to behold. His face forever to behold. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. 
Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. Only Son of God Sent from heaven, hope and mercy at the cross. You are everything, you're the promise. Jesus, you are all to us. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the measure of our lives we believe you're all to us you're Gracious God, you are our Heavenly Father, our perfect Savior, our loving Comforter. You alone are worthy of praise. By you, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. All things have been created through you and for you. You are before all things, and in you all things hold together. There is nothing outside of your hand, Father. All that you have ordained to take place will happen. So this gives us great comfort to remember and to rest in and to trust in. Thank you for being faithful, holy, righteous, and true. To, alone, to you alone we give our praise and our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Well, we come this morning to the very end of Romans chapter 3. If you would turn there in your Bibles, Romans chapter 3. Turn there or turn them on. And we will be at the very end of Romans 3. Every paragraph of Romans we've seen so far is just so full of truth and wisdom and spiritual food. We could, we could camp out on any bluff in Romans and just spend the rest of our life there and never go hungry. It's just so, so rich and so full. Romans chapter 3, and true to form, we're going to take um, a couple few weeks to look at this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's so rich. Romans 3, and follow along in your Bibles. I'm going to read our text. Romans 3, verse 27. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says, By the Spirit of God, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but a law of faith. 
For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Again, true to form to the Apostle Paul, this is another weighty text. It is a, a great text. It's one that brings a lot of questions to mind and one that you will hear from time to time. I hear this, you hear this. You will hear people say something like this. I don't believe in organized religion. You ever heard someone say that? Maybe you've said that. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking that now, and, and you're not sure why you're here. I, I don't really believe in any of this. I don't believe in organized religion. Any number of reasons are given, and many of which we would agree with. You know, hypocrites, unloving leaders, uh, an ingrown fellowship, a, a stagnant people. They're stagnant in their love for people and for others outside of themselves. I think some of this is perspective, really. Some other things that we'll see, but I think many view the church from the pew and what they really need is the perspective of the cross. It's very easy to see all of those things and we could add to that list and we could say, yeah, there, there's a lot of problems with the church and the organized religion of it all. But when we see things from the perspective of the cross, it's different. Now, I happen to believe that we shouldn't run from what the Bible acknowledges. And, and so I believe in both organized and disorganized religion. I'm a firm believer in both. Organized religion and disorganized religion. Organized religion is uh, that which is organized by the Lord Jesus Christ under him as the head of the church. All that belong to him, he knows every single one of them. He knows them by name. He knows all of his sheep. He doesn't lose one. He has organized them through the power of his blood, and they belong to him with that which is imperishable. That's a great organizing principle, isn't it? We have organized and disorganized religion. So we have a perfect Savior, but we also have imperfect sheep. Organized and disorganized. We have complete justification, but we also have uh, an imperfect ongoing sanctification that's still being worked out. What is right with organized religion? Well, first of all, it's the design of Jesus for His church. We are ordered around certain organizing principles or truths and realities. As we said, Jesus is the head of the church. That's an organizing principle. He builds it. He adds to it. He maintains it. He, will, he came for it the first time. He will come for it again. And the church has an organized border that is marked by regeneration, salvation in Christ. He has even given elders to the local expressions of that church. They shepherd in light of the physical absence of Jesus until the chief shepherd appears and comes and returns for his church. He has commanded all churches to organize, to gather every time. And when they gather, they regularly read the scriptures. They pray, they sing, they hear the word of God proclaimed. They encourage one another in the faith and they share life together in an endless variety of ways. That is an organized church. He has commanded this group, the church, to go out and make more disciples. And they are to do that in the unified, organized, singular name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then they teach an organized body of truth that Jesus said, Go and teach them all that I commanded. And Jesus upheld the veracity and the truthfulness and the inerrancy and the power and the weight of all Scripture, the Old Testament and the New each church needs a certain size trellis to maintain the spiritual work of the vine in that light. This is the work which the Lord gives to each local church. And this is biblically organized religion. 
Yet for all of our organization, let's be honest here, everything else is fairly disorganized, isn't it? You should just hang out here during the week and see some of the disorganization that goes on. As we grow in our love and our understanding of Christ, as we grow in our understanding of His glorious gospel, it will continually shine a light on what's wrong with organized religion. The things that are not fully formed, the things that are still imperfect, the places where we have to grow. The organizing principle that brings us together as a church is not our affinities, it's not what we look like, it's not our backgrounds. What brings us together as a church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. You can't gather this people. Just look around. We like different teams, different things, different places, different states, different regions, different foods, different affinities. And I haven't even started to meddle yet. But the organizing principle that brings us together is the gospel. Anything else will not hold a church together. When we lose sight of that, we're done. If we lose sight of that, we're done. At the end of Romans 3, Paul helps us identify some areas and ways of thinking that are out of step with the gospel, this organizing principle. These are things that are out of character with the reality that Paul has been toiling away, unpacking, uh, helping us understand for the last three chapters. Verse 27 begins a new section that focuses on the vital theme of faith. If I had my ways, I, I, would, I would start chapter 4 here at chapter 3, verse 27, because really this is the front porch to what's going to follow here. Chapter 3, verse 27 through 31 that we read this morning is the initial statement, and chapter 4 is a more detailed elaboration. In fact, you're going to see the key words that are used here in this text this morning are the words that Paul will expand on in chapter 4, and he will use Abraham as a uh, case study, so to speak. So it's an introduction and summary to chapter 4. But in these last five verses, the Apostle Paul shows us that it, what is truly wrong with organized religion. And his perspective is refreshing. It's, it's not caustic, it's refreshing because it, it's not coming from someone who's jaded. It's not from someone who's trying to deconstruct everything that Christ is building. Paul's perspective is not from the disorganization in the pew, but from the divine order of the cross. That's how he sees it. So everything that Paul says now comes out of all that he has said about justification in Christ before this. This is why it's so important to see everything that comes before verse 27. If the gospel is true, if the gospel is present and alive in our church, then there are some realities that need to be mortified. There are some things that need to be shown the door. There are attitudes and habits of the heart and of the life that have no place in the organized religion of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Like what, you might ask? Well, Paul identifies a few of these here. We're going to look at the first one this morning. It's the word pride. Number one, pride. Why? Because boasting is excluded by the gospel. If you believe the gospel, there is no place for pride. There is no place for, for boasting in anything that we might achieve or bring to the table. Look again at your text at verse 27. Paul asks, a series of three questions in verse 27. Where then is boasting? He says, it's excluded. Second question, by what kind of law? Third question, of works? No, but a law of faith. We, we see there are those three questions. And the first is there, where then is boasting? And he answers his own question, it is excluded. The boasting in this particular context is likely Jewish boasting. We've seen since chapter 1, uh, very early on, there is this Jewish-Gentile dynamic that Paul is dealing with all throughout Romans. It starts in chapter 1, it goes all the way throughout this book. It is, a, it is heavily influenced and falls along this, this uh, theme that is woven throughout. And that's certainly the case here. 
Remember, Paul is addressing a church that began with a Jewish character to it. The, the first church in Rome was, were, were Jews who converted to Christ in the synagogue. And they, they came to the Lord as, his, as their Messiah. They believed in the Lord. And as the church grew and expanded, Gentiles became part of the church as well. But during that time, really before that really came on in heaps, uh, the, the Jews were dispersed from Rome because of an order by Caesar, and they were under persecution. So they were dispersed, and they went out to other places. But after that was uh, alleviated later on, they began to come back. And so these founders of the church come back to the church where they were charter members, only to find people that are not like them at all. Can you imagine such a thing? I know that doesn't happen today. Can you imagine being gone for a year or more and you come back and you see all these people that weren't there when you left? I mean, just imagine if you would. Go out on a limb with me this morning. The Gentiles are added. Jews are dispersed because of persecution. They come back to the church at Rome. And there's tensions, and, and the tensions are, are real between folks who, who not just grew up in different neighborhoods, they were enemies before they came to Christ. The Gentiles did not like the Jews, the Jews did not like the Gentiles, and that's just putting it lightly. They were enemies, mortal enemies. But now something radical has happened, and that is they have all been changed by Christ, and they have all been joined to him and have union with Christ by faith in the Lord. And Paul seems to think that some Jews thought their practice of the law constituted some kind of claim on God. We were here first. We had the law. We had the prophets we had the first promises of the Messiah, they might claim. We know that because Paul's already hinted at that earlier in the first few chapters. He'll come back to that whole section, Romans 9 through 11. He's going to resolve this whole tension of Gentile and Jewish dynamic. Some Jews thought their practice of the law constitu constituted some kind of claim on God. Look at what we do. We are the true followers of Messiah Jesus because of, look at us. We're the ones that are most faithful, most pure. We go back all the way to the beginning. Why is this even a question? Well, there's, there's certainly Jewish examples of this in the teachings of Jesus and in Paul and other places. In Luke chapter 18, you'll remember that Jesus gave a parable there, and, and the parable works its way out as between a Pharisee and a tax collector, a publican. And the Pharisee is the, the one who would be loved and appreciated in Jewish society, and yet he is the one who is trusting in himself in Luke 18. Why did Jesus give that parable? He says in Luke 18, verse 9, Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. So this is one of the outworkings of self-righteousness. We trust in ourselves. We trust how we got ourselves here. We look to our own works. And when we see other people that do not measure up the way we have measured ourselves up, we view them with contempt. Philippians 3, Paul uses another old Jewish example. Do you know who the example is there? It's himself. He says, here's who I was before Christ. He says in Philippians 3, 4, I, I myself, I have confidence. I might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I far more. Why? Pharisee of the Pharisee, Hebrew of Hebrews. It goes on down this, this pedigree and this list of achievements and accomplishments and all the things that he's done for God. To what end? Paul answers the question. It's, it's all trash. It's all cow manure. It's all a, a pile. It, it merits nothing. Well, is Paul just putting the Jews in their place here? Well, not entirely. Because, see, they don't have a corner on the market for boastful arrogance, right? That belongs to humanity. It belongs to all of us. It's not merely a Jewish problem. It's, it's common to all people. How so? In, in Scripture, we learn that Greeks boasted in their wisdom. 
Roman engineers marveled at their aqueducts. In Rome, people felt safe because they were assured they had the most powerful military the world had ever seen. Many things to boast in. In Rome, they would have looked to their way of life. It was far above and superior to all other nations at that time from their vantage point. Their own accomplishments. Look what we have done. Look at all the acts and the conquering of other nations and all the wealth and the riches and all the things that are taking place. Look at our strength. These are just ancient problems, right? Paul says, in effect, in in light of everything we have set up to this point, where then is boasting? In light of everything, Paul says, in light of everything that I've taught you, where then is boasting? What's his answer here in verse 27? Look at it. It's excluded. It's shut out. It's like shutting the door in its face. Paul says there's no room for this. The second question By what kind of law or what kind of principle? Here, Paul is using the word in verse 27. Look at it very carefully. He's using the word law in a non-technical sense. He's not using it in a Jewish sense, referring back to the Jewish Old Testament or Moses or the the Torah. He's using it in a non-technical sense. The word law here is a metaphorical usage. It, It has the sense of a principle. So it might be read this way. By what kind of principle? Of works? No, but by a principle of faith. And then he asks a third question. Is it by works? Well, he's assuming here, if the organizing principle of your life is your works, then, then boast away. But if it's not, you belong to Jesus. Is it of works? And Paul's answer to all of this at the end of verse 27 is that our life belongs to Jesus, not by our works, but solely by faith. That's how he answers it, and it's very easy to miss that. In some translations, it'll put the phrase of faith earlier in the sentence, but it's still the same idea. Uh, we, We belong to Jesus by the principle of faith, not by the principle of works. And so the main point and the burden of Paul's argument here is that righteousness is by faith, not by keeping the works of the law or anything else. So boasting is self-announcing, while faith is self-renouncing. Boasting comes in and it says, here I am, look at what I've done, look at all that I carry to God. Surely he'll be excited to see all of this. Boasting is self-announcing, but faith is self-renouncing. We renounce everything, anything that we might bring in our hands, anything that we might use to commend ourselves to the Lord, anything that we think might merit us favor with God, we renounce it. We do that by faith in Jesus. You might say it this way, faith technically achieves nothing. If by that we mean as a work, it is is an empty hand that receives and trusts in what God gives. That's what faith is. Faith is not a, a work that we perform. It's not a hoop that we jump through. It is an empty hand that receives and trusts in what God has done for us. There's no credit to be claimed. There's no accomplishment to admire other than the credit of the righteousness of Christ, other than the accomplishment of the finished work of the cross. Now, notice carefully how Paul grounds this assertion. He explains it in verse 28. He just made the assertion in verse 27. He's asked it in the form of a few questions. Now, verse 28, here's the main idea here. For we maintain, we hold, we reason that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He says in verse 28, we, for we. Who is he talking to? Paul is speaking, this is an editorial we, this is an apostolic uh, usage here, preposition. He, he He is speaking of himself and all that he has taught. Here's what we maintain. Here's what we've been proclaiming to you. A man is justified by faith apart from works. Martin Luther, when he 
translated the scriptures into the German language and putting the scriptures no longer out of reach in the Latin, but he went back to the sources, to the Greek and to the Hebrew, and he translated the scriptures and he put it into the language of the people so that they could read their own Bibles in their own tongue and understand it. But when he translated this verse, verse 28, he inserted a word. And by inserting that word, it got him in trouble with a Roman Catholic church. You know what word he inserted? Alone. Right after the word faith. So it read, a man is justified by faith alone. And they didn't like that. On the surface of it, that raises questions for us, doesn't it? He's adding words to Scripture. The Bible's pretty clear. You don't do that. You don't tamper with the text. So the Catholic Church came after him on that and many other things. What they failed to realize is that the godfather of Catholic theology, Thomas Aquinas, did the exact same thing. Origen, Theodore, Hilary, Basil, Ambrosiaster, Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria, they all did it hundreds of years before Luther. Why did he do that? Well, the word alone does not appear in verse 28 in the original or in many of our translations. But he did that because he was giving the people the word, the scriptures in, their vernacular, in the vernacular that they could understand. And that is the literal sense of what Paul is saying here in verse 28. In other words, what else can this mean when Paul says our justification is by faith apart from works of the law? It is by faith and this excludes everything else. Therefore, this faith is alone when it comes to our justification. By the way, all translations insert words for smoothness of translation. That's what Luther was doing. He was not adding to the text. In fact, he captured the very sense of this verse that all Scripture testifies to this point that a man is justified by faith alone. Paul said this very clearly in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man may, what? Boast. Same principle is going on here. What is the law here in verse 28? Well, we said there's a non-technical use in verse 27. Some of our translations even capitalize, look at verse 28, they even capitalize the use of the word law here. It's different than the use in verse 27. The word that he's using for law here is, is the normal word that refers to the, the body of commands given by God through Moses. It's referring to the law of Moses. Uh, that could be in its most, uh, in its, its most uh, narrow perspective of that, being the Ten Commandments, which is a summary of the law. Uh, it could be the whole uh, Torah, which is the first five books of our Bible. It could refer to all of the Old Testament scriptures, which are often called the law of God, which are an exposition of the first five books. No matter how you slice it, he's referring uh, fundamentally to the very first works of Moses, the law of God, its summary in the Ten Commandments, and its exposition in the other books of the Old Testament. But here in its most narrow sense, it's the law given through Moses. That's what he's talking about in verse 28. We maintain, we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law of Moses. It is not by doing those things. It is not by checking a box of the Ten Commandments, you have it on the wall and you have little squares and you check it off each day. Didn't do this, didn't do this. It's not that. Paul was combating a Jewish perspective that saw obedience to the law as possible. But Paul has been laboring to show that human sinful nature makes obedience to the law impossible. He said back in verse 23, just, just a few verses ago, all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God. Uh, the, the point of the law is to show the glorious name of God. It is to reveal God in his holiness, in his attributes, in the character of his righteousness so that he will be extolled and glorified. And yet no one does that. Not even Moses, who received the law, could do that. Paul's point here is that no one can come to Christ through their own works, through their own obedience, through their own goodness. 
Do you believe that? Are you trusting in your own works? Paul has another book of the Bible, another letter that he wrote to the church at Galatia. And, and in that book, he's combating a, a similar but different issue. And it's that you, you came in through faith and by the Spirit of God who saved you, why are you now trying to, to work that out in some other way? Not by faith and not by the Spirit of God. Why are you trying to check the box? He talks about what it means to walk in the faith and in the Spirit. A lot of those same themes are here in Romans. But here is the organizing principle of organized religion that will be, uh, that will be upset if we allow this to run rampant. It is pride because it is excluded by the gospel. Now next week we're going to see two more problems with organized religion. Go ahead and put those up there. Uh, the next one will be division. It's not an issue today, is it? Division in the church. Uh, because obedience is established by faith. We're going to talk about what that means. We'll see that there in verses 29 and 30. And then we're going to see aimlessness, pointlessness, because obedience is established by faith. So then what is the place of obedience in the life of the Christian and the life of the believer? These are three problems with organized religion. It's pride, it's division, it's aimlessness. But I want to come back to number one here for a moment. How might this kind of boastful pride manifest itself in the church today. The scripture actually has a lot to say about this. I want to give you just a few of these and then we'll pick up here next week. How, what does boastful pride and arrogance look like? Not, not in the world, not out there somewhere, but in the church. What are the dangers for us? Paul is, Paul is warning against this. He's writing not to unbelievers, he's writing to the church in, 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 in warning of, of mission drift. That here's how you came in, and he's been explaining that and unpacking that for the last three chapters. But now we might drift into a lane that doesn't belong to us. What would this look like? How might this kind of boastful pride manifest itself in the church? Number one, when we forget who we are. When we forget who we are. Our salvation did not begin at a place of pride and self-achievement, but it, it began with the humble confession in no uncertain terms that we are poor in Spirit. We have nothing. Listen to how Paul, you, you don't need to turn there, but listen to how Paul brings this out in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27. He, here's, here's how God has organized his church. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. At the very end of that, when he says, let as it is written, he is quoting there from Jeremiah 9, which we'll see in a minute. That is a foundational text. It's one of Paul's favorites. He'll, he'll quote from it again in Romans. He'll quote, uh, James will quote from it as well. What does prideful arrogance look like in the church and by extension in the Christian marriage and in Christian parenting and in Christians in the workplace? It, it looks like this. It looks like when we forget who we are. We forget where our boast is. How we got in. How we are here. Secondly, when we make plans that ignore God. Make any plans this last year? As I said before, um, at the beginning of 2020, pretty much everything we planned for the church and everything I planned personally just kind of went out the door pretty easily. Man makes his plans, but it's the Lord who directs our steps, right? We make, when we make plans that ignore God, and I, and I don't mean just throwing a, a bone at God as if just to kind of uh, satisfy him and settle him down in the corner, but truly present everything before the Lord. Here's how James frames the question. He says, you in the church, he says, we need to be careful of this. We'll go to such and such city, and we're going to move there, and we're going to make a profit. Has anybody said that? Come now, you 
who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such city, we'll spend a year there, we'll engage in business, and we'll make a profit. What does he say? Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You have no idea. You are just a vapor, a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say what? If the Lord wills, we will do this or that. But as it is, he says, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Have you presented your plans and your desires to the Lord? Well, I prayed about it as if that resolves everything, right? That's not what we're talking about. That's, that's a Southern Christian for stay out of my business. You know what I mean? Have you really thought about this biblically? Well, we prayed about it. Oh, okay. Have you really presented, have you really washed it in the word? Have you really sought biblical wise counsel or just someone who will affirm what you already have concluded? When we make plans that ignore God, James says, it's evil. It's evil. Let's not call it something else. What else? When the organized church ignores sin in our midst. There's another case study in 1 Corinthians 5. You have a man who is involved in, in ugly, awful sin with his stepmother in 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul says there, it's sinful boasting when we tolerate unrepentant sin, not realizing that, that such is prideful arrogance. And he says it affects the whole church, just like leaven. He uses that example, like leaven working its way through dough. If you put it just in the edge of the dough, it will work its way throughout the entire church if it's not rooted out. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, your boasting, he's talking to the church, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? A church that will let me go in unrepentant sin and not pursue me with patient care and love is an arrogant church, Paul says. It's not a church you want. It's not a church that you want to be a part of. I think many people want to hide out with their sin in churches. And quite frankly, they're at home doing that in many places. But when we ignore sin in our midst, what, what does that mean? That does not mean that all of a sudden we are going after one another. It means this. We are seeking to restore one another, to love each other, to care for each other. This is like a child who is about to run out in traffic and you pursue them, right? And not because you hate that child, but because you love that child. When we ignore sin in our midst, Paul says we're arrogant and it's only added when we celebrate our tolerance and our pride in such thing. He says your boasting is not good. What else? When we, number four, when we see weakness as an impediment to ministry. Weakness is what the Lord wants. Weakness is what the Lord uses. Do you understand that principle? This is contrary to the way even the temptations for us as a church to, to really focus on our strengths, whatever those may be. But it's actually weaknesses that the Lord uses to strengthen his church. Paul says this. This is a major theme in 2 Corinthians 11. And it goes into chapter 12. For two whole chapters, he sustains this theme of weakness in ministry in the church. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 27, he, Paul, Paul goes through a list. Remember his list in Philippians. It was, here's all the things that I, I, I was before Christ. Here's my pedigree. Here's my education. Here's all of these things. I just lay it all at his feet. It's nothing to me anymore. Here's what I've exchanged all of that for. I've been in labor and hardship, many sleepless nights, and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, these are things that happen in the world, these are things that have happened to me, Paul says, there is the internal daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. And here's how Paul feels it. He says this, he says, who is weak without my being weak? When my brother and sister is weak, 
in the faith, weak in, in something that's going on in their life, some trial, I'm weak as well. I'm affected by that. Who is led into sin without my intense concern, Paul says. And then what does he say? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. And then he goes on to give an example. Paul has seen things that you and I will haven't seen, but we will one day see. Like the third heaven. And the Lord gave him a messenger of Satan. The Lord gave him a messenger of Satan to buffet him, to keep him from exalting himself so that his boast would not be in the things that he has seen and the experiences that he has had, but in the Lord alone. And the Lord says to him in 2 Corinthians 12, as he recounts that, he says, the Lord has said to me, my strength, after I pleaded with the Lord, take this away, the Lord has said, what? My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. If it wasn't for Paul's weaknesses, he would not be who the Lord made him to be. I will boast of what pertains to that. This all crescendos in, in one final one I want to give you, when the object of our boasting is forgotten. When the object of our boasting is forgotten. Turn, if you will, back over to Jeremiah chapter 9. If you kind of get to the middle of your Bible, you might find Isaiah, and then right after Isaiah is Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 9. If you're in the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and all that, just keep going. You'll get to Isaiah, then Jeremiah. This is the weeping prophet. He is writing and warning Israel that God is going to do two things. He is going to destroy them for their sinful rebellion. That's not great news. He's going to destroy them for their sinful rebellion and their hard hearts. But he is also going to miraculously rebuild them from a remnant of believing Israelites. In Jeremiah chapter 9, we don't have time to look at the whole chapter, but look down at verse 23. Thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh, who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares Yahweh. Notice a few things here in these two verses. There's a list. There's two lists. Do not boast in this. Do not boast in man's wisdom. This is what Paul's talking about. This is the text that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 1. Where he's talking about Greeks and their signs and what man boasting in their wisdom and the debaters of this age and all of those things. Do not boast in man's wisdom. What does that mean? Intelligence, prowess, cleverness, our insights. They, they mean nothing. Don't, don't put your boast there. Those will not merit us anything. Those do not earn, rebuild, or garnish favor with the Lord. Do not boast in man's strength is the next on the list. What is that? That could be any number of things. That could be strength of mind. That, that's very similar to wisdom. That's strength of body, of, of being young and exuberant and, and actually having uh, muscle structure as a young man. Those things will fade from you. And so if you boast in it now, it will eventually be gone along with your hair. Trust me. Don't boast in your body, don't boast in your mind, don't boast in your power, don't boast in your control, don't boast in your authority. All of those things can be easily taken away from you. And they will be. Man's strength. Some boast in chariots, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Man's riches, he says. Is that a temptation? Is that a temptation to put your hope there? I know that it is. It's one thing, and James, by the way, we go back to the James passage. He doesn't say, don't plan. He doesn't say, don't make plans to move or to have a profit. 
but to present all those things to the Lord in truth and to truly bathe them in Scripture and wisdom and knowledge of God's Word. But woe to you who trust in man's riches. Paul says those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And yet you can hear that and still think, well, I'd like to try then you really don't understand the weightiness of what the Bible says to us. Guard your hearts, church. Don't boast in these things. Do boast. Look what he says here in Jeremiah 9. Do boast in knowing the Lord. Do you know him? Do boast, he says, in his loving kindness, his chesed, his steadfast covenant love by which he has bought us, he has bound us to him. We belong to him through Christ. Do boast in these things. Do boast in his justice. People are crying out for justice and I promise you, they will not find it until the just judge of the earth comes. It makes all things right. That does not mean that we do not pursue justice. We have a court system. We have laws in the home and in the country and in nations and all of those kind of things. But you just need to understand, if you put your hope there, you will be disappointed. Many are finding that out. Boast in his righteousness. Boast in his righteousness. This is what we've been talking about for three chapters in Romans. Romans that we are not right in and of ourselves. But God sees us as righteous through the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't make us right. He sees us as right. He declares us as right. And he imputes the righteousness of Christ to us. And our sins are laid in turn on him. It is a glorious exchange. Boast in this church knowing the Lord, His loving kindness, His justice, His righteousness, and then notice there at the very end of that, He too delights in these things. This is the heart of God. This is what He delights in. I pray that the Lord will use this to strengthen our church and that this will be our boast in these days. Would you pray with me? Lord, we can live and survive without many things, I may live at times in this world without friends, without wealth, without honors or pleasures, but we cannot live without faith in your Son. We confess and acknowledge before you our own weakness. We are insufficient for anything that is spiritually good. We have all been laid low by our pride. At various times, we have misplaced our boasting. We have experienced it a thousand times. We trust, in, we trust ourselves and we move ahead in our own weaknesses. But Lord, help your church today to distrust itself and to rest in you. May we continue to be poor in spirit so that we know and rest in the loving kindness, justice, and righteousness of Jesus alone. And this all by faith. This you delight in, Lord. So take delight as your church boasts in you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing about Jesus, that he is a friend of sinners and a strength in weakness. Are you grateful for that this morning? Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes 
me home. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Jesus, what a strength in weakness. Let me hide myself in Him. Tempted, tried, and often failing. He, my strength, my victory wins. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Amen. Jesus, what a help in sorrow while the billows o'er me roll. Even when my heart is breaking, He, my comfort, helps my soul. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Saving, helping, keeping, loving. He is with me to the end. Please be seated. Got a couple announcements before we dismiss with the benediction. The first one is, Lord willing, we are uh, planning to go to Boys College for uh, a youth conference. We plan on leaving tomorrow morning. We'll be back Thursday evening. Please be praying for us during this time. It's really a great opportunity, just really around relationships. Um, you know, not every youth believes, so it's an opportunity for them to come into a saving relationship with Christ. For those that do believe, it's really a great opportunity for them to grow in Christ. And it's really also an awesome opportunity for us to just grow in our love for one another. So please be, please be praying for that. <clears throat> the other announcement is on Saturday, June 26th, our high school graduates are having a reception here at the church from 1.30 to 3 p.m. That's Saturday, June 26th. And please be praying for them and their families because this really is a, you know, it's a big transition in all of their lives. And now we'll close with the benediction. Please stand. We will say it together. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And all of God's people said? Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>